Hello, my name is Stephen Hicks and I'm a seismologist from University College London. With the help of a few of my co-authors, this video is going to summarise our new study out in the journal Science that shows how climate change led to a nine-day long global seismic signal. We solved this mystery with a huge open collaboration of 68 scientists. Here is our paper and you'll find a link to this in the description below. Starting on the 16th of September 2023, we detected a completely unusual seismic signal. It looked like nothing we had ever seen before. It came from somewhere in East Greenland and it spread around the world, from the Arctic to Antarctica in less than an hour. No place beneath our feet was immune to the tiny ground vibrations. Each tiny flashing point in this animation shows a seismic monitoring station lighten up in response to the wave spreading around the world through Earth's crust. The signal looked nothing like an earthquake. If we were to hear the vibrations from earthquakes, they would sound like a rich orchestra of rumbles and pings. Instead, the signal from Greenland was a completely monotonous hum. A simple sine wave oscillated up and down through 90 seconds. It lasted for nine days. It was so unusually long and strange looking, we initially called it an unidentified seismic object, or USO for short. So where exactly in Greenland did this strange seismic signal come from? It came from the remote and uninhabited Dixon Fjord, part of a twisting branching network of fjords, some 200 kilometers inland from the open ocean. Dixon Fjord has steep sides, over a thousand meters high, with a number of gullies on its southern slopes, each containing glaciers plunging steeply into the waters of the fjord below. And here is one of these gully glaciers, plunging steeply into Dixon Fjord. This is where all the action happened on the 16th of September 2023. To explain more, I'm going to hand over to my colleague, Christian Svenevig, from the Denmark and Greenland Geological Survey, or GAIS for short, who is the lead author of this study. Here's the uh, close-up view of the glacier, uh, taken just a couple of weeks ago before the landslide happened. The next photo is uh, taken by the Danish uh, dog sleigh patrol of the Danish army, the Sirius patrol, and shows um, how the glacier has uh, glacier and mountaintop had changed um, during the event. You see the missing uh, mountain sheet at around uh, 1.2 kilometers elevation. The glacier is uh, has lost about 10 meters of its of top, and uh, down here at sea level you see a uh, 100 meter high not. But you also see a server up a 200 meter run up uh, from the initial splash. And here we are a couple of kilometers west of the last flight, where we see a, a drone uh, pass by. That's the run up, 80 meter high here. You see how it's completely uh, removed the vegetation of the area and uh, destroyed the, yeah, all the top soil. 70 kilometers further west, uh, the wave uh, inundated the base uh, at Ilau. That was at this time unoccupied, but uh, the run-up here was around 4 meters and it reached 80 meters in length, destroying a lot of equipment that was uh, based there. We also knew that a major tsunami had happened because scientists previously installed some sensors in the fjord, including a gauge that measures the elevation of the water surface. Before the 16th of September 2023, the data from the water level gauge shows a twice daily rise and fall due to the ocean tides. On the 16th though, we see a clear spike in the data due to the tsunami. However, this sensor only sampled the water elevation every 15 minutes. This meant that the biggest waves were not recorded. The following footage show how the last slide in the tsunami destroyed uh, this previously very beautiful glacier. The before view uh, is uh, seen in the inset photo. Even here, nearly a year after the event, where co-authors visited the shore, minor rockfalls still uh, travel down the glacier into the fjord, leaving plumes of sediment in the shore water. This drone footage shows how the glacier looks uh, near three, three days after the, the landslide, which taken by the Danish military as they inspected the area. You see uh, how the lower parts of the glacier is wiped clean by the tsunami, the wider upper parts is uh, full of fire and debris. Satellites passing high over our head, uh, also caught the landslide. We also see on these before and after images how uh, 
inflation uh, and uh, and mountain peak are intact, and now afterwards here yeah, the mountain peak is missing and the glacier is uh, stained black. What we also see is the uh, glacial peninsula uh, at uh, sea level, which is missing. What ultimately caused this landslide? Well, it points towards climate change. Our data shows that the steeply plunging glacier below the mountain top had actually been thinning to uh, 30 meters in the decades up to the last slide. So we believe that the glacier had thinned so much in the years up to this happening that it actually couldn't support the mountain top anymore. Now, it wasn't just this monotonous 90 second period signal that our seismometers recorded. If we filter our data to higher frequencies, we can see a sort of rougher looking, higher pitched signal at the onset of the event that lasted only a few minutes. It turns out that this signal comes from the landslide itself. Detailed analysis of this higher frequency signal allows us to track the exact path of the landslide from the mountain, down the glacier, and into the fjord, confirming the satellite observations. So to summarize, we know that climate change triggered a landslide down the glacier which plunged into the fjord, generating a 200 meter high tsunami. But normally tsunamis locally dissipate within minutes to hours. So what caused the nine day long global seismic hum? This remained the key missing piece of the puzzle. So I'm now going to hand over to my co-author, Paula Kulemeyer from the University of Oxford to explain more. This map, focused on East Greenland, shows seismic stations around the world that recorded the highest quality observations of the very long period monotonous signal. Each station is colored by the type of seismic surface wave that was recorded. Purple stations mainly recorded a side-to-side -side snaking type of motion, which we call a love wave. Green stations recorded an up and down rolling motion called a Rayleigh wave. we find the greatest love wave amplitudes in the southwest to northeast direction, while the greatest Rayleigh wave amplitudes are in the northwest to southeast direction. This can only be caused by a force oscillating back and forth at 90 degrees to the long axis of Dixon Fjord. The dominant oscillation period of 90 seconds of the seismic wave also matches the resonant frequency of the fjord, if we account for its width, just 3 kilometers, and its depth of 540 meters. Our observations could thus only be explained by the tsunami evolving into a fjord transverse sage, a standing wave of fjord water sloshing back and forth every 90 seconds. Sages are fairly widespread phenomena, occurring in lakes due to strong winds and over ocean basins due to weather effects. But why did this sage and Dixon fjord last for nine days? There have been no such slowly dissipating sages reported in the scientific literature before. Back to Stephen to explain the final piece of the puzzle. This animation of our numerical simulation shows how the initially chaotic waves of the tsunami stabilized into a gently oscillating fjord wave, sloshing back and forth from one shoreline to another and back every 90 seconds. It took a very detailed map of the water depth in the fjord, mapped to every three meters to generate this numerical simulation, showing how the tsunami evolved into a seiche over the nine days. Tsunami simulations are not normally computed at such high resolution, so it took an extra special computational effort in our study. This back and forth motion of the fjord water's center of gravity transferred momentum into the fjord walls, transmitting seismic energy through the surrounding crust. It was this seiche, like a beaten heart in Dixon Fjord, that caused the seismic waves to spread all over the world. Our simulation shows that the wave kept going for nine days due to a multitude of factors. The dead end at the western part of the fjord and the sharp bend to the east meant that the tsunami couldn't easily dissipate, especially as the open ocean is some 200 kilometers further down the fjord. You can see in the animation how after some time, very little energy got round past that bend. The narrow parallel sided fjord walls also minimized dissipation. It may have also helped that the fast landslide picking up speed over the glacier entered halfway down the fjord and at right angles to its long axis sending much of its energy into the opposing shoreline. 
perhaps for the first time, we are having to look beneath our feet to see the impacts of climate change. What happened in Dixon Fjord would have sent vibrations through the ground beneath the feet of everyone in the world. No area was immune. This study wouldn't have been possible without the Herculean efforts of all our co-authors and all others that contributed data imagery and even sounds for our scientific purposes and for this video. Thank you for listening.